Today we're going to be looking at mind maps and how mind maps can help writers. Um, they're sometimes known as spidergrams, but me and things with eight legs rarely get on, so I'm going to stick with calling them mind maps. That's right with you. Um, and what we'll be looking at in this video is how you can use mind maps, how you can make one, and why you would bother. So what use are they to a writer, how they can really help you, and um, there'll be easy steps for you to follow to make your own mind map and to know how that is going to benefit your work and your stories. So stick around because by the end you will be proficient at mapping your own little mind, imagine that. And I'm going to show you some of the mind maps I've used with my own books. So the first one I have to show you is this one. And this is the mind map, the actual piece of work that I used to produce a book called The Sorcerer's Appendix. What's that you say? You've never heard of The Sorcerer's Appendix? Well, let me enlighten you. This is The Sorcerer's Appendix. Um, for those of you who know my witchy books, this is a different series, and I write these um, under the name PJ Braxton. And this is a comic crime fantasy historical series. Um, just so you get the order. The first one is called Gretel and the Case of the Missing Frog Prince. And the second one is actually a prequel to that one, Once Upon a Crime, which sets out how she became the private detective that she is. Then we went on to a cruise with Gretel and her brother Hans, and this was the case of the fickle mermaid. You're seeing a pattern developing here. And then the fourth one, which came out in the US and Canada in um, October, was The Sorcerer's Appendix. So the book actually does exist, but it all started with the mind map. So we're going to have a look at that and I will be showing you exactly how I use the mind map to get from here to book number four in a series here. Okay, let's have a look. Okay, so here we have the mind map I made for the Sorcerer's Appendix. Um, now as you see at the middle we've got the title. If you don't have a title that's fine, just put the main theme or the main thing that the, the book is about, so I might have just put Gretel and the Sorcerer or anything like that at this point, you just want to put the main thing in the middle. If you've got a title, great, even if it's just a working title. So then going out from there you have your main characters. So we have Gretel, uh, the Sorcerer, um, and we always put in something about what they're doing. So the Sorcerer has been murdered, Gretel takes the case, there's the Sorcerer's Widow, She's the one that engages Gretel for this case. And then going out from her, we might have a secondary point that the life insurance won't pay out. That's why <coughs> the widow has um, engaged Gretel for the case. Then you're going to have um, some of the settings. So here we've got at home in Gestenstadt. We've also got down here, though, the forest, because this is going to be huge in this particular story. This is really important to Gretel, so that needs to be big and clear. Coming off from that, as you can see, we're going to have other things. So the forest means they're going to have to be camping and hiking. And those are not Gretel's favourite activities, believe me when I tell you that. So that's got to go down there. That will remind me that there's an um, opportunity there for some, some comedy because this is a, a comic crime novel. There are also going to be other characters. So we're going to have some um, non-human characters. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at possibly a nymph here. There's a bat in this book at this stage. I'm not entirely sure. And that makes me think, OK, we might need more. We might need to have a little list coming off our mind map. Lists of names, or in this case, lists of possible um, fantasy creatures um, or, or animals that I can use. And I've put here ones used so far because being a series, I've already used <laughs> quite a lot of animals and, and, and creatures, and you need to keep track of those. So they can all go down in one little corner of our mind map. And then coming back up, further up, some of the characters we need more backstory and this is where you can put backstory in as well um, so we've got details of, of, of the sorcerer's background and maybe possible suspects because it's it's a crime novel um, then we've got some other subplots so there's an upcoming concert by Herr Mozart here and that is going to play an important part in the love story between Gretel and Ferdinand and because he's her on off will she won't she um, romantic interest I've got to keep track of Ferdinand, so he's going to be linked to um, Gretel's story there. So that gives you an idea of how I worked from that one. And from that mind map, I was then able to get um, a proper chapter by chapter breakdown 
of um, the whole story. And every time you get stuck when you're doing your outline from that, you can come back to your mind map. You can think, OK, what else have I got here? What other ideas has it generated? What are these little notes at the corner that just came to me at the time when I was brainstorming this activity? Because they will be down here. You're not constrained by trying to write decent sentences or make the thing coherent in any way. You are just putting your ideas down. I mean, this little character here called Teddy Fries. I don't know if there's any Bear Grylls fans out there, but you'll see where I'm going with that. He actually ended up being called Cornelius Staunch, largely, largely because I, I didn't want to get sued, but also because it just fitted um, the story better. But that was where he started in that little bubble there, and that's what grew out of that particular session of brainstorming. I've also put up here this very ambitious idea that it's going to be organised perfectly into 18 chapters of 3,750 words each. Well, it wasn't, um, but it gave me a starting point and something to build on with all my brainstormed ideas. And just to show you that um, this works for all my books, so this was for the book that I am doing the ARC giveaway for at the moment. This is for The Little Shop of Found Things. Uh, the first book of my new series. I've actually written Mind Map before I start and then away I go. And in this case I've got a little drawing in the middle because that is the shop which is going to be the main focus. Um, and out of there come the main things, the Chatelaine, the setting, Wiltshire, the subplots attached to the setting, the main characters, Xanthi, Flora, um, the town itself. Then we go back to the, the 17th century elements, so all those little bits are clustered down there, but we can see how they might link up. And it really is helpful. It really helps me to generate subplots and more ideas, as well as to organise my work. And this is um, for another idea that's very unformed at the moment, but I just wanted to share this with you. I don't even have a title for this book. It's a piece of literary fiction. It's something completely new. And I know that the crucial thing to this story is this common element that the characters are going to share. Um, so I put that in the middle. I'll probably make about four mind maps of this one because it's going to be a very complicated book. But it's giving me my start point um, that I have different characters. They're not named yet, um, but they give me ideas of their background, their setting. It's, it's a beginning. And once you start doing this, look how much I've scribbled down here. All these different ideas have just sparked from doing those simple things, even when you don't have the characters' names, you don't have really very much to go on at all, just by the activity of starting to draw nice fat swirly circles and, and just let your pen play around and do a bit of creative doodling and, and thinking without being constrained, as I say, by writing things in an orderly fashion, your disordered mind is far more able to access these other ideas. Oops. So let's recap on the system for your mind map then. Piece of paper, nice pen, you can sit outside, you can be in bed, you can be on a train, you can do these anywhere. Um, the main thing is you don't have to write sensible sentences, you don't have to know an awful lot as we've seen from, from some of the ones that I've done. You may not have the names, you may not have the title. You're brainstorming the idea but you're doing it in a way that is using a pen, which is something we don't do very often, but I really think that connection with a piece of paper that is quite creative and artistic helps you to free up your mind. Um, just let yourself put down whatever comes into your mind about the book. First of all, you're going to use um, the title or the main central theme of the book, the main characters, um, the setting, the story problem or question is going to come out, then you're going to put that in, in another bubble, and you can link these things out. and. I really think you'll find that once you start, you generate all sort of stuff, and that comes to the brings us to the why bother. Nothing generates more story, in my experience, than making a mind map. You might have a brilliant character, a brilliant setting, and a bit of an idea, but you're not sure if it's really got the legs to make a whole 100,000 word book, um, or a series, or something like that. You want to test it out. If you make a mind map, you will generate subplot, you will generate minor characters, and for me that's the most helpful thing that a mind map does. It generates those characters and those ideas that are going to really make your book deeper, richer, more multi-leveled and more interesting. So um, that's the why bother, and have a go, see how you get on. Let us know in the comments um, whether the mind maps work for you, whether you can stand calling them spidergrams, because it won't be me doing that. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we will be looking at more ways to generate ideas and to develop those ideas further. But uh, meanwhile, good luck with your mind maps.